Ignition sequence start. Five, four, three, two, one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Bring forth the living creature after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Look at earth from outer space. Everyone must find the place. Give me time, give me space. Give me real, don't give me fame. to think in terms of being a brand because if you don't brand yourself other people will greed is good i care so much about myself i make all things new Tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Yeah, cool. That video was made by an Emmy Award winning uh, filmmaker for Hope a few years ago for Christmas and I thought it was a great way to start the Thanksgiving and Advent and Christmas season here at Hope this year as we finish up reading through the whole Holy Bible in a year. Hey, a big hand for everybody who's there, who's done it, who's getting close to the finish line. What, praise God for all of you, I'll clap for you. Standing ovation, well done. All along during this year, we've invited you to read the Word of God, learn it, and live it. And probably the live it is the most important part. It's hard to live it, of course, if you don't read it. So I don't want to minimize the read it or learn it part either. But it's in the applying of God's Word. It's in the application. It's in the living it out where things really start to make a difference. Look at earth from outer space. Never a bad idea to hear a Coldplay song at church. Look at your life from the perspective that God has on your life that he has given to you as a gift that he has made. Look, look, at, look at these things and open your eyes, as the lyrics of that song go. Open your eyes to see, to look and to consider where you're standing and, and the things you're standing for, the pathway that you're on. Is it the illuminated pathway of nothing less than the God who made you, created you, and also created this universe on purpose, for a purpose? Or are you drifting in the shadows and the gray or the, or the pitch black darkness or, or in and out of that gray to the darkness and back and forth of living your life according to somebody else's will, of living your life according to your own will, uh, of looking at your life and saying, hey, I'm just here to get what I can and do what I can and get it what for myself. But that doesn't produce what we want it to produce and it doesn't lead us where we want to go. There's a TV show called Lessons in Chemistry that's relatively new. I'm not necessarily recommending it or not. And this is a deep subplot. This isn't even the main thrust of the show. But I was fascinated to see on one of the latest episodes the friendship that develops between a pastor and a scientist. It is a myth. It is a false dichotomy to say to you, and it's a lie that this world tells to us in so many different ways. You must choose between being a person of faith or a person of science, because you could never be both. Because as the lie goes, faith and science contradict each other. Well, it depends. Faith in what? Faith in what scripture actually says or faith in what people say the Bible says? Faith in the narrow definitions of what scripture says and, and the claims that if you don't believe 
our wrong-headed view, our very narrow-minded view of, of what the point of the opening chapters of the Bible are in creation that, that isn't the point of the Bible anyway. Any fifth grader reading this text that was written thousands of years after the creation of the universe, even young earthers would say that. And I don't care if you're a young earther or an old earther or, or, or how you feel about that. What I care about is, are you taking Genesis seriously? The main point that there is a God, that he made you, and then that we as the human race, Adam means human beings, humanity, that we fell away from God. I wouldn't at all be surprised if there's actually a dude named Adam in heaven when we get there. And that there's a woman named Eve and that they were indeed the first two human beings. I've got no issue with that at all. That's not what I'm preaching against. I'm preaching against narrow definitions. That isn't what the Bible ever intended to say. So there is no conflict between faith and science. All the pastors in this church, all, almost all the pastors I know, the greatest theologians, the seminary professors are fascinated fans of science. I am too. And this church is filled with scientists who are fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Arguably the greatest scientist in the last generation, Dr. Francis Collins, who spearheaded the Human Genome Project, who pushed forward, you know, studying DNA and, and, and all of this, and really changed the way we do medicine, or is beginning to change the way we do medicine. He is, a, by his own confession, a fully devoted follower and a born-again follower of Jesus Christ. He's all in with Jesus, the greatest, at the minimum, one of the greatest scientists of the last generation. And he's not alone, as a lot of the great scientists of the past are as well, as are a lot of you who are scientists. My son-in-law is a doctor. My, my daughter went to med school. She's an occupational therapist. They're people of science, and they're people of faith. You don't have to choose one or the other. Absolute lie from the pit of hell. Total nonsense. And you know what it does? It forces people to give up on God. And that's a tragedy. It pushes people away from the one true faith in Jesus Christ. That's what I love about this friendship that develops on this TV show between Reverend Wakeley and Dr. Evans. This is in the 1950s. That's when this story is set. Dr. Evans is on the cover of Scientific American. He's this young, up-and-coming, brilliant scientist who everybody in the scientific community knows of and reveres. The Reverend Wakeley is a brilliant seminary student at Harvard Divinity School on his way to becoming a pastor. But the Reverend Wakeley is also fascinated in science. And so he goes to one of Dr. Evans' lectures. And after he hears it, he's inspired and he's troubled at the same time. So he writes Dr. Evans a letter. And they develop a friendship. Take a look. RNA and DNA may be comprised of only four nucleotides, but... Their chaotic processes indicate that life is born of random, infinite permutation. Dear Dr. Evans, I have no background in chemistry, and yet after listening to your lecture, I felt compelled to write. I find your work fascinating, downright exhilarating, in fact. But I think your research may be overlooking the mysteries of the divine. What if God is a spontaneous generation? What if the missing link between nucleotides and early life forms is in fact a force that science alone cannot explain? I simply share your affinity for questioning commonly held beliefs. Respectfully, Curtis Wakeman. Oh, that can go at the end table there. Thank you. Dear Mr. Wakeley, Reverend Wakeley, I'm unclear when you are bestowed the title. As if it bears stating, I am a staunch atheist. But regardless of one's views, only an intellectually dishonest person could watch a chromosome undergo the metaphase of cell division and still believe that an all-powerful bearded man in the sky designed it that way. But please, convince me otherwise. I've never been one to shy away from a good debate. Yours, Calvin Evans. Dear Dr. Evans, thank you for your response. I have never had the pleasure of watching a chromosome in metaphase, so I will admit to my bias. But I believe that the mystical and the natural are not fundamentally opposed. The way I see it, science is the how, 
and religion is the why. I love everything about the way that's written. I love the respect underneath it, other than the kind of smug little reply that the scientist has where if you see the, the, this under a microscope that you would know that some bearded man in the sky didn't do it. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say God's a bearded man. I just want to make that really clear. <laughs> if you get to heaven someday uh, and you see a bearded man and you think that that's God, it's probably Dallas Hockman. You, you, you need to kind of stay focused on that. It, it, sorry, Dallas, you're the first beard I saw when, when I looked over there. God is God, and God is not some mysterious, made-up, fictitious character, you know, in our minds who's floating around up in the sky. In the sky, God is in his heaven, and God is here through his Holy Spirit, and God loves you so much he sent his son Jesus, the personification of God, so that you could get to know him as a real human being, not just some imaginary friend. That aside... The conversation is deeply respectful both ways. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. Jude, from our Bible reading for today, in the message translation says, go easy on those who hesitate in the faith. Let me ask you, look at earth from outer space. <laughs> look at your life from God's perspective and the pathway he puts, wants to put you on and me on and his church on. Open up our eyes to see. Let's think about these things as we finish up this year, hopefully well and hopefully faithfully. Open up your eyes to see that God's calling us to live with love for those with whom we disagree. When you encounter somebody as a believer, and let me say this right up front, this church has all sorts of people who show up here who identify as agnostics or atheists or skeptics. I love that about this church. You know we don't agree with you. You know what we preach and teach. We don't water down scripture. We don't try to hide Jesus. We don't try to do, you know, shallow little messages that are more pal palatable for, for, for folks that are just little tips for a little bit of a better life. We're not just teaching morals either. We're teaching spiritual things. We're teaching with the, uh, the, the confident belief and trust that there is a God and that there is a Jesus, and there is a Holy Spirit, and that this God made us and loves us. And so we disagree with atheists who say, I know that there isn't a God. And, and, and we might even disagree with agnostics who are still trying to find God and aren't sure, or skeptics. But make no mistake about it, you are welcome here, you are safe here, we love you and we welcome the conversation, and we welcome all the questions that you bring too. What's in your heart, Christian, those of you who call yourselves Christians, what's in your heart for the atheist you know, for the agnostic, for the skeptic, for the one that you'll sit across the table from at Thanksgiving on Thursday? What, what will the conversation go like? Or what if you're completely diametrically opposed politically or on social issues of our day? And so there goes, there goes, you know, crazy cousin Fred. I don't know why I keep picking on Fred. Let's call him Bartholomew. So here's crazy cousin Bartholomew, and here's, here's Aunt Susie. I did Susie last week, too. Here's Aunt Gladys, and they're going at it, and the fireworks start shooting, and oh, boy, they're, they're, they're now you'll pass the, pass the stuffing, please. Change the subject. But what if we could learn to disagree without being disagreeable? What if we could have conversations like their letters back and forth? where we actually push each other a little bit, but we do it in love. We do it with the motivation in our heart is, I love Bartholomew, and I love Gladys, and I love this whole family, even the ones who rub me the wrong way, or, or push my buttons, and that God has put me at this table to do just that, to love them. To, to, to not always have to agree with them. I don't know where the lie started that we have to agree with everybody in order to prove our love. If agreement is a prerequisite for love, then I don't love my kids. And they don't love me. Because they don't agree with everything I do. And I don't agree with everything they do. I don't know when this lie started socially that in order to really love me, you have to agree with everything I do or everything I say or everything I think. Nonsense. 
That's the darkness talking. That's not the light of God's love and his word, which says learn to speak the truth and love to one another. The basis and the foundation is love. It isn't to win arguments, it's to win souls. It's for the sake of representing as a faithful ambassador, Jesus Christ at your Thanksgiving table. And I don't know why we put so much pressure on the Thanksgiving table. Let's talk about lunch today, or dinner, or breakfast tomorrow morning. Or all the things that happen in between the meals, 24-7, the way I relate to other people, the way you relate to other people, the way we treat our friends, the way we treat our enemies, the way we talk to the people we agree with, the way we shut down and won't even have a word for the people we disagree with. Does that sound like Jesus to you? It certainly doesn't sound like the Bible I've been reading this year. Like in Jude chapter 1, go easy on those who hesitate in the faith. Go after those who take the wrong way. Not go after aggressively like tackle them and tell them how wrong they are. The Greek word means rescue them. Seek to save them like a lifeguard seeks to save somebody who's struggling out in the water. Go after them with love. I want you to live because I love you and I can't. The, way I, the, the fact that I love you is more important than me winning an argument or a debate with you or even a point with you. And then Jude says, be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. You don't have to agree to be agreeable, to prove your love. Question that lie. Push back with love on that lie. Say, why do we have to agree in order to, to, to prove that we love each other? Be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. Why should we not be soft on sin? Because it's dark, because it's evil, because it leads to a lot of hurt and pain. Last night when I was walking from my office here to the sanctuary to preach the sermon, the lights were off because we were going to do all the lights on the Christmas trees in the parking lot last night. And as I'm walking, all the lights are off in the, in the offices that I'm used to. And I thought, well, I can navigate my way here. I don't need a light. I know where these hallways go. And sure enough, as soon as I walk with a little bit too much confidence, bam, right into a, somebody put a table of TV trays right in the middle of the hallway. And if the lights were on, I would have seen them and easily not been in pain while I was preaching last night. That's just an illustration. Sin is hurtful. It produces pain. It causes us to get into all sorts of situations that are not pretty. We, we dare not give sin a pass. Like it's no big deal. Because everybody's doing it. And that's true, everybody's doing it. But that doesn't mean God's for it. That doesn't mean God wants us to continue to do it or think it or, 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 or live that way because it's a prison of, of darkness. And Jesus came to open that prison door and set us free. So be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. As Reverend Wakeley and Dr. Evans continue their pen pal relationship across the country, they start to become friends. And now it's dear Calvin and dear Curtis. And they even talk to each other and, and, and tell each other, hey, you're the best friend I've got. Even though we completely disagree, even though we've never really met other than the pastor hearing one lecture that the scientists gave, but they rely on each other and they, they make each other better because of it. Are your ears open? Are you listening? Look at earth from outer space. Look at your eyes, look at your life from God's perspective. Look at my, I need to look at my life from God's perspective. Open our eyes to see that God calls us to walk a new path. On the next screen, 1 John declares, if we say that we live in God's light, but we hate a brother or sister, that's darkness. It's still dark, and so the psalmist cries out, Psalm 119, check your pathway, check the road you're running down. God's word is a lamp to guide our feet and a light for our path. So I, I want to speak truth and love to you, but understand it's coming to me today too from God's word from Jude. This little tiny official epistle from another apostle at the end of the New Testament that packs a huge punch. And maybe it's one we need, a wake-up call. to Say, hey, Christian, Enough with this soft kind of, hey, give sin a pass, it's all good. And I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about me. 
the way I excuse it, the way I, the way I say, oh, well, you know, that's just who I am. I, I can't change. That's a lie, too. Of course I could change. Well, God could change me. If I just get over myself enough to empty out my own ego and make room for God's spirit to fill me up and put me on the pathway he created me to walk and not give in to thinking, well, there's nothing else in my life that could ever change. Look, this is not about salvation. We are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. God's mercy is wider than our sin. Preached on that last week. It gives us the assurance of our salvation to eternal life. This is about what will life be like this side of heaven again. And that's what these later epistles get to. The three Johannine epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, James, and also Jude. So I'm calling this sermon, Hey Jude. Not this Jude, you know, from the song, now that it'll be stuck in your head all day. There are worse songs to have stuck in your head all day. <laughs> na, 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 everyone. Na, 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 na. Na, 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 hey. Do you know what that song's about? Do you have any, you have been singing it your whole life, probably. Do you know it's about Julian Lennon, nicknamed Jude, who was the son of John Lennon and his first wife, and there's little, almost baby infant Jude, not long after he was born, and Jude is upset. He's in a dark place as a little kid because his dad's divorcing his mom and is starting to hang out with Yoko Ono and it's breaking Jude's heart. So Paul McCartney, who's like an uncle to Jude and has taken him under his wing, writes this song for him. Hey Jude, take a sad song and make it better. And then he writes some other lyrics and you can read all, you can Google this just to check me out to make sure I'm not like imagining things. And he writes some other lyrics that are really about mysteriously, when you grow up you'll fall in love and then you can begin to make it better, 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 better. Ah! Judy, 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 Judy. That's him. That's who Paul has in mind as he sings this song. Hey, Jude, don't look so, it, it, it's not so bad. Take this sad song, make it better. What it's, I find interesting about that is that what Paul McCartney's trying to do, successfully or unsuccessfully, is to write a song that's eight minutes long. No, <laughs> what he's trying to do. And by the way, those of you who are complainers about, oh, those praise and worship songs, they just repeat the chorus over and over and over again. But the Beatles are classic, man. Those are, <laughs> do not go after the Beatles with me. Hey Jude is one of the greatest songs ever written, which repeats the same chorus 139 million times. It's classic. But I don't want to sing about God over and over. I want to sing about this kid. That's what I want to do. It's classic. Just having a little fun with you there. Sometimes it's good to see the things that we believe in so deeply for just how shallow they are. But what I like about this song and the lyrics of this song, the poetry of this song, is Paul McCartney is the uncle figure in Jude's life is saying, you're on a bad pathway. Let me direct you to where the light is. Take a sad song and make it better. That's why Jude is writing this epistle. I want to make sure you get back to the light, church. Jude isn't Jude, the son of John Lennon and his first wife. Jude, who writes this book of the Bible, is the brother of Jesus. Did you know Jesus had brothers? <laughs> Some of you are like, no way. Way? Mark chapter 6, verse 3 says he had a bunch of brothers. James, Joseph. James wrote another one of the epistles. We looked at that a few weeks ago. Judas, which is the formal name for Jude, and Simon. Did you know he had sisters too? What do you think it'd be like to live up to that example if you were one of the little brothers of Jesus? Why can't you be perfect like your brother? <laughs> well, because he's God, maybe, I don't know. It's kind of, a, kind of a high bar, you know, to try to jump over. But this is the Jude, and he's paying attention to Jesus, and so he notices along the way. And because he knows what Jesus is for, his brother, he says, here's two things, Christians, I'm deeply concerned about the way you're living. You claim to be walking in the light, but let me show you your darkness. Some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, and the problem with that isn't that they're here. There's nothing wrong with anybody coming to church. It's that they are influencing others. They are teaching others. They are leading people astray, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. 
And the Greek word for immoral lives here is seldom used in the whole entire New Testament. But Jude brings it out, inspired by the Holy Spirit, on purpose. What it means is kind of this really literal sense of violence and sexual promiscuity. And it's either one or the other, or they're both mixed together. It's dark as dark gets. It's kind of like, you know, we see in the world today with human trafficking, which is why we're taking a big swing as a church during Advent. Our whole Advent project, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be uh, putting light on these things. And I'm not just talking about human trafficking overseas in other countries. I'm not just talking about human trafficking in Chicago or New York or Houston or L.A., the big cities. We're talking about human trafficking as a major problem right here in central Iowa and Des Moines. This mixture of violence and promiscuity and using people as human beings, as objects, and, 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 and treating them as if they're owned by, by people who have power and privilege. And it's just so dark. And if the biggest church in Iowa doesn't take a big swing at that darkness, who are we? So we partner with Dorothy's House. We've done this for years. This isn't new for us. We've been doing all sorts of things. One of, one of their biggest supporters. But this Christmas, this Advent season, we want to really step it up. We want to we wanna stand against the things that Jude says are dark, as dark as darkness gets. There are people who say not only that this immorality is okay, but that God's grace gives us a free ticket to practice it. Applied to our daily lives in a not quite so dramatic way, I hope, it means that we can just say, again, this is just who I am. I, I got to live my life. This is the way I, I, I don't need to follow God's rules. I don't need to follow the light of God's word. I don't need that lamp for my pathway. I don't need that light for my feet. Look at earth from outer space. Look at your life from God's perspective. Open your eyes to see just how much pain and suffering and hurt my sin causes to me and to other people, your sin causes to you and to the people around you and to community and to the world around us as things just kind of erode. Come on, church. Be the church that you've been called to be. Don't give the darkness of sin a free pass. Don't deny Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, as Master and Lord by doing so. Jesus, this Jesus who is our Savior and Lord says, look, you think your big enemies in this world are other human beings who have a different worldview than you? The non-believers even, the atheists, the agnostics, the skeptics? It's nonsense, Jesus says, to paraphrase his teaching in the Gospels. He says, the enemies that you should really feel, fear are the supernatural ones, the dark forces, the devil, his demons, all, all of the angels who are kicked out of heaven by the, by the archangel Michael. On the next screen, please. So this Michael, even the archangel, which means he's the top angel, the general of the, of the heavenly warriors. Did you know that the devil was an angel and there was a war in heaven? And it was once upon a time because the devil shows up in the Garden of Eden at the beginning of creation. But there's also an, a, a, a sense in scripture, and we'll look at this in two weeks in Revelation 12, that it's also going to be before, be, be before Jesus' second coming. And then in the Gospels, Jesus says to his disciples, and when they come back from a really successful missionary journey Jesus says I celebrate with you I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven so time's kind of a well, it's a different concept in heaven so it happened then and it'll happen again and it happened in Jesus day but the point is this Michael kicks him behind <laughs> he uh he he took a, a, a powerful force an angel the devil and he went to war with him because the devil was spreading lies and there's no room for lies and darkness and sin and evil in heaven because there's no room for the suffering and the death that that sin leads to. And so the angel destroys the devil, kicks him out of heaven. 
And so now that devil is here and he, he tempts us. And so God's way of overcoming that temptation and that sin is through Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Here comes the light breaking into the darkness. And I'm telling you, the devil is not the kid in the Halloween costume who shows up at your door uh, with the horns and the tail and the pitchfork. It's just silliness. Do not be intimidated by that eight-year-old, okay? <laughs> be intimidated by the devil you don't see. The one who tells you, hey, it's just you. You got to do you. Stay with your darkness. Stay, stay with that stuff that hurts you and your family and your friends, and your social circles, your coworkers, your classmates, your teammates your neighbors, stay with that. That's just who you are. You could never change. Everybody always tells you you could never change. It's a lie. Look at the pathway you're on. Open your eyes and consider the source of that pathway. Who told you this was the pathway for you to walk? You? Somebody else? Somebody spinning the news for you? The way you want it spun? And giving you a free pass to hate people who disagree with you? On where you stand on these things? And dismiss them? And buy into the lie that scripture has no room for? That if you disagree, you can hate? The Bible says the opposite. If you disagree, you have to love your enemies. This is the light that breaks through the darkness. Your word, God, this is why we need to read it, learn it, and live it. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. It puts me on a new path. It challenges the pathway I'm on. It challenges the source of that pathway. And I think when we peel back the layers, a lot of times we we'll realize, oh my goodness, it was the enemy of God who put me on this pathway. Tempting other people to tell me things or influence me in certain directions. That's what Jude is so concerned about. And I don't want to water it down and, and try to smooth out the edges for you. You can take it. Because you do not need to be intimidated by this devil when you let the light of God's love break through for you. When you understand that prison door of darkness has been opened for you, that you are now free. You have been given freedom. It is for the sake of freedom that you've been set free, the Bible says. There's a battle going on for your soul. Did you know that? Sometimes you sense it, don't you? Sometimes you can almost, like the angel over here and the devil over here, telling you, you know, do this. No, don't do that. You're, this is just who you are. And God says, I, I made you for more. And you know I made you for more. Turn down the volume. Hit the mute button on the enemy of God who tempts you. And turn up the clarity and tune in the light of God's word that is a lamp for your feet, an illumination for a new pathway that will set you free. This is how God overcomes the enemies that we can't defeat. Classic Christian theology, They're taking a summary of the whole Bible. Jesus' death and resurrection wins a victory for you over the forces of darkness, over evil, over sin, and over death. Enemies that you and I can't defeat on our own. I mean the real enemies. Not the uncle at the Thanksgiving table who drives you crazy. The real enemies. The ones who tell you it's okay to hate him. It's okay to dismiss him. It's okay not to love him. Those are the real enemies. God loves you so much and he gives you his light, the light of his love, and he wants you and me to reflect it Three verses later, Jesus says, we know John 3.16. Most of us have not memorized John 3.19. Three verses later, Jesus goes, so the light of God's love is broken through, has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. And so Jude says, instead of that, stop listening to the people who are putting you on the wrong pathway. Start following the Jesus who loved you enough to go to a cross to die for you so that you don't have to be intimidated by the supernatural forces of darkness. You don't have to be intimidated by death. You know what it is, and you know what it isn't. It isn't the end. And so Jude says, this is how you live out the Christian life. This is what the new life looks like. This is what the illuminated life looks like. Build each other up. 
Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit with confidence that the God who's in your corner is the one, you know, who beat the snots out of the devil like three times in the Bible and kicked him out of heaven. And every time God and the devil go toe to toe, well, God's the undefeated champion. Who's in your corner? Who do you allow to bark out instructions to you? This is the way you should live your life. This is who you are. Who identifies you? Who tells you which pathway is right and which pathway is wrong? As the friendship develops between the pastor and the scientist, the scientist falls in love with one of uh, the other scientists at the lab where he's doing all these experiments. But he's afraid because of the darkness of his past that once she realizes who he really is, she could never love him. That she could never spend the rest of her life with him. So he gets a wedding ring and he's going to propose, but then he chickens out because, well, his past is so dark. And that's when his best friend across the country encourages him with letters that are right out of the pages of Scripture. Choose love. Take this leap of faith. Understand that there's grace, that if she really loves you, she'll have grace for you. And so he builds up his friend. He prays in the power of the Holy Spirit. He awaits the mercy and the grace that God doesn't just give to you and to me and to her, but gives for us to share, read the Word of God, learn it, apply it and live it out. When we apply God's grace and the light of His love, we start to realize, oh, this light isn't just for me, it's for me to reflect to the world around me. When you see the Christmas lights at Hope that we flipped the switch on last night, when you see the Christmas lights at home, or as you drive through neighborhoods. I mean, go ahead and enjoy the beauty of it and all that. I think that's great. I do. But I hope you look a little deeper. I hope you see the point of all those lights. I hope you understand that they're a representation of the light of God's love that came into this world when Jesus was born. The light that shines in the darkness that the darkness could never extinguish. And I hope you know that this is the light that God gives for you to reflect and to shine. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So last night, I know a few of you were here, but most of you were not. We uh, were expecting a little bigger crowd than usual on Saturday because we were doing this special thing, turning on the lights on the tree. We finally found out what to do with all the pandemic journey to the light, Christmas lights. We put them all on one tree. Actually, we'll put them all on all sorts of trees all around here. It's beautiful. But it's what those lights represent that I preached about last night and I want to end today's sermon with. Joy to the world. Joy to you when you find the pathway. When you find the light of God's word, you learn it and you live it. Your word, God, is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Look at earth from outer space. Look at your life from God's perspective. Open your eyes and see. But there is a God who loves you. And that light of his love is for you. And it changes everything. You want joy, untouchable? You want peace that passes all human understanding? You want to know that you know that you're loved forever? Then receive this light. But then Jesus, as he does, surprises us. He goes, you know that light that God gives you? Now I'm telling you it's in you and I want you to shine it. Let it shine before others that they may see your good works, your good deeds, and glorify your Father in heaven. That's the pathway. Build each other up. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit for each other. Have love for each other. Focus more on winning souls than winning arguments. Don't believe the lies that you have to agree in order to love somebody or to prove your love for somebody else. Push back. But as you push back, do it with love. Speak your truth in love. Come on, Christian, if you don't do it, who will? If you don't walk this path that God has put out before you, the path of light that the, the lights outside in our parking lot represent, who's going to live it out? 
And so, since you've chosen wisely to come to the service where there's a little more elbow room today than last night, where people were literally sitting all the way up to the candles, the prayer candles on both sides, and in the back rows of the, of the bleacher seats up there, there aren't any chairs, but people decided there were by pretending to lean against the wall and make it a chair. Standing room only, the bridge was full, the chapel was full. So, you get to see the lights on video. And you can drive by tonight for free. It was free last night, too, just for the record. And and, and you can see the lights, but when you see the lights, understand the meaning. What will you do this Thanksgiving and Advent and Christmas season? Who will be able to stand up and testify on December 31st and say, I was loved by that person, by you, by me, in the way Jesus has called us and illuminated a pathway for us to walk And to live out with the love of God that is for us, but the love of God that God wants to move through us. Who can testify that you loved him like that by December 31st? Take a look at the joy that this light brings into the world. The joy of God's love. if the mic's on. Let your light shine, church. Let the whole world around see your love. Win souls instead of winning arguments. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Advent. Merry Christmas. Live it out. There's a pathway for you to walk. Try it.